and welcome to 2024. And we're gonna ring in the new year with a Centurion project that's gonna push me right out of my comfort zone. What, what better way to bring in the new year than that? But if you are uh, new to the channel or you joined perhaps for a different project like the Bendix G15 or the UE1, you may not be familiar with the Centurion. And well, this is it. This is my uh, Centurion mini computer from the late 1970s to early 1980s. I can't pin an exact year on it because this particular one is a collection of parts spanning about a 10 year range. Uh, the computer, which is located down here in the bottom, has an AM2901 bit slice uh, based CPU. It does have multi user support, can support up to 32 simultaneous users, has 256K of RAM, and a plethora of other interesting expansion cards for supporting the hard drives. Now the current hard drives that are hooked up to it is a Hawk drive here in the middle. This is five megabytes fixed, five megabytes removable. Then above that on uh, this little tray that pulls out right here, we've got an eight inch uh, Finch drive, which is 32 megabytes. And then we have an eight inch floppy drive. This is dual sided, dual density. So we have all sorts of interesting drive options for this. And not but two years ago, we didn't think we'd even be able to get it to turn on. And here we are able to boot from three totally different drives and it all works perfectly. I absolutely adore this machine. From the software to the hardware, it's just an absolute joy to use. But this primary cabinet here, topped off with the beautiful ADS Regent 100, is pretty much complete. So what's next? Well, we have this secondary cabinet over here, which has another Hawk drive in it and a Phoenix drive on top of that. And then sitting on top of all that is an EDS PC. This is actually largely unrelated to this machine, but it was built by Centurion themselves. So I ultimately want to turn that into a data terminal. I'm just missing the monitor. I got to hunt that down. But aside from just adding more storage and more terminals to this machine, there is one big thing missing. And that is that I don't have any way to get text on the screen to text on a piece of paper in my hands. And in order to do that, we need a printer. And it just so happens I got a printer with this machine when I found it uh, many years ago, and that is this beast right here. This is an Odec made 100 line per minute chain printer. It is an absolute behemoth. I cannot move it around by myself. It weighs an absolute ton, and uh, I am really excited about it because I wanna see this thing spitting paper out the top. But it is in very, very rough shape, and I have never tried to restore a printer in my life. So this is definitely uncharted territory for me. So I'm not gonna try and rush through it. I'm not gonna try and squeeze too much into a single episode. We are gonna take our time, learn everything we can about this printer because I think it has a lot of really fascinating stuff hiding out inside and bring it up slowly and properly. So our goal for today is to uh, find a way to get this out into the center of the room and uh, start taking some of the panels off to see what it is that we're working with, what kind of mountain we have to climb. And ultimately, I hope to get the power supply out so we can see just how crusty and terrifying it is. So we got a ton of work to do. I'm glad to have you here in 2024 joining me. So, well, let's get to work. First things first, let's get some furniture sliders under the four corners of this beast. I use these sliders on everything in here that doesn't have wheels and they work fantastically. I was able to push this behemoth out into the center of the room all by myself. Uh, and then let's open up the little door on the bottom and remove the box of green bar paper. This will remove a considerable amount of heft from the machine too. The top is just sitting on there, so let's just get it out of the way by lifting it up and out. And this is one of my favorite features. You can pull this little bar up and the whole chain mechanism rotates out of the way. That makes it easy to remove the piece of paper that's stuck in there. Next, let's get to the electronics on the inside. There are four thumb screws that hold the paper guide in place. Then it just pulls right off. There are four more thumb screws that hold the metal cover in place beneath that. And then it lifts right up, giving access to all the cards that make up the logic of this printer. And I'm glad I got this thing open because <sighs> dirt daubers, man, these things are an absolute menace. They build nests everywhere. Well, let's get these cards out so we can get the dirt dauber nests out. Fortunately, they just pull straight up and out with ease. Then we'll pull the hammer driver boards out as well. These are pretty wild looking. Uh, and there's one last board at the very end here that has all the power and data connections on it. 
Once we disconnect everything and remove the ground wires, it's finally free. And look at this wonderfulness, more dirt dauber nests. All right, we've got all of the logic boards out of the printer and <laughs> it's a little bonkers. There is no large scale integration going on anywhere. It is all 7400 series logic chips. Uh, so for example, this is a 7411, this is a 7406. Uh, I don't have those numbers memorized offhand, but essentially this is building up complex logic out of uh, chips that have uh, four or so logic gates on them. Some of them are D flip flops, but it's pretty much just building logic the hard way. This is pretty awesome. And when we look at the date, it makes sense because right here it has a date on it of 4076. So this uh, printer is from the 40th week of 1976. And that definitely is predating uh, large scale integration. Um, this, the, as a result though, there's absolutely no way to know what each individual board does without sitting down and reverse engineering the boards. Uh, I do know that this board over here has a, a little tag on it that says 125 LPM. So perhaps this board was changed out depending on the speed at which the printer it was being used in. Uh, over here, these boards are pretty interesting. These are all the driving boards for the hammers. Uh, it is a 132 characters wide, but there's only 66 hammers in the machine. Uh, you can see this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. So 22 per board, three boards gives us 66. And uh, that means that they're using uh, one driver to do double duty for two hammers to punch out two different characters. Um, so <laughs> that's going to be a fantastically complex mechanical system that we'll have to uh, address later. But uh, pretty much I'm not doing any troubleshooting or anything with these today. I just wanted to get them out so I could uh, give the machine a bit of a clean. Um, the next step is to try and get that power supply out. To get to the power supply, there's a little door on the back that folds down after loosening the two screws. The power supply itself is on a little sled that slides right out the back for service. That's very nice, thank you. Uh, next, let's see if we can get the main PCB off. We'll disconnect all the connectors first, then remove the seven screws holding it in place. And the three that go through into the transformer are actually isolated with little plastic washers. But with all those removed, that finally comes free. And it's a tight fit, and the strange heat sink design on the far right makes it really fiddly to get out. But I eventually figured it out and got it free. Next, let's get this boxer fan out of there. It needs a deep clean and some more dirt dauber nest removal, it seems. I also want to get this massive capacitor out. Fortunately, it has screw terminals for connections, which makes it easy to disconnect from the rest of the circuit. Then we just remove the bolt holding the tie down clamp and the big boy capacitor pulls right out. With all the electronics out of the way, it's time to get the shop vac involved. There's all sorts of cobwebs, dust, dirt, grime in here that needs to be cleaned. After a good vacuum, I went through with some simple green and scrubbed as best as I could. I didn't want to remove the rest of this power supply from the machine as it would have required a massive amount of disassembly, particularly with the wiring. So I'll just scrub and wipe down as best as I can, and it cleaned up relatively nicely. So I also gave a big scrub to the surrounding metal. There was a lot of caked on dust that came off with ease with the simple green. To get that dirt dauber nest off the boxer fan, sometimes it requires mechanical scraping like this to get the worst of it off. I'll go through and clean the residue off with simple green later. Finally, to clean the PCB, I just use a paintbrush to knock the dirt and dust loose, and I keep the shop vac nearby to keep my table from getting too filthy. All right, cleaning is going pretty well. We were able to get the power supply board out and up here on the bench pretty easily. It's kind of an awkward shape because they have these huge heat sinks sticking off the uh, end here, and um, they've got some dust on them that is just caked on there, did not want to come off. But uh, that's a pretty interesting way to do it because those sit right uh, behind that boxer fan. So they're going to have a lot of airflow pulling across them. Uh, but it does make it difficult to set up here on the bench and work on. Uh, other than that, though, it looks like a fairly standard linear power supply. I guess I'm not a power supply designer, so nothing is really leaping out at me. There aren't any integrated circuits on here, with the exception of these little metal can jobbies right here. These are uh, Motorola MLM205G. Uh, and I can see that they have a ton of pins on them. So these might be op amps or they might actually be some kind of integrated circuit. I'm not sure. Uh, Editing David will 
show the data sheet for whatever those are or whatnot. Um, you can see that uh, <laughs> this resistor back here appears to have gone bad at some point, and uh, it was replaced with this kind of gold thing here. This is really kind of loosely placed in there, but um, that was an official repair, so I am going to work on the assumption that that is functioning and I'm not going to replace anything. So uh, unless it proves uh, to be bad, we're just going to leave it alone. Uh, I've also removed the two large capacitors that were uh, right here. They were just simple screw-in capacitors. That would be this one, which is a 18,000 microfarad at 25 volts, and this one, which is a 9,000 microfarad at 50 volts. Uh, I also removed the chonker of a capacitor that sits below it. This one is awesome. It is 60,000 microfarad at 40 volts, and it is a beast. Uh, the reason that I removed all three of these was so that I could uh, pull out the bench power supply and put some juice into these uh, separate of the power supply itself to see if they're going to come back to life. Uh, these look like they're really high quality stuff, so I'm sure they're going to be fine, but we'll just put a little bit of energy into them and see what they do. Uh, and if they all look good, we'll just install everything back together and that should bring the power supply uh, back up to being cleaned and ready to go. Okay, I've never actually done this before, so I have uh, absolutely no idea how it's going to go. Uh, but I've got the uh, current limited power supply set up here. I've got uh, both the current and voltage set to absolute bare minimum. Uh, we'll go ahead and bring the current up just a little bit. And uh, I saw that it, f it, it moved some current and then it made it to 1.6 volts. So if I bring the voltage up, we should see a little bit of current as it charges the capacitor. And then the current should go away as the capacitor gets fully charged. Yeah, there we go. That's, uh, that didn't go all the way to zero, but I mean, <laughs> we're at 5.2 volts across it. Let's keep going up. We can see it's definitely picking up some current as it charges the capacitor up. There's 15 volts. This is the 25 volt uh, capacitor. Um, we can see the current is uh, not zero, so there might be a little bit of leakage in there, but it's... Uh, it's not bad. Let's um, bring the voltage all the way to zero and watch what our, our voltmeter over here shows. See how quickly this dissipates. 13, 12, 11. Oh, you can see it up here too. Um, I wonder if that's just from the power supply dragging it down. So let's unplug that and see what happens. It... Dipped. <laughs> I mean, it's not perfect. 7.8, 7.7, 7.6. It's definitely uh, leaking out some voltage. It should be pretty steady. But I think if we go back and forth on this a couple of times, let it go up to about 10 volts, let it come down, do that a couple of times, that'll reform the capacitor and it should be pretty solid. So I'm going to spend the next uh, 10 minutes doing that on these and uh, we'll see how it goes. The 9000 microfarad capacitor reacted pretty much exactly the same. They appear to be a little leaky. I wouldn't expect the multimeter to supply enough of a load to drain the capacitor. I think the input impedance on this multimeter is supposed to be on the order of 10 mega ohms or something. So probably they're just a little leaky and need some more time to reform. Uh, the big boy capacitor at first wouldn't even take a charge at all. It was acting like an open circuit completely. But once I got above about 10 volts, it finally woke up and started taking a charge correctly. Unlike the other two capacitors, this one seemed to hold its charge a lot better. Again, it probably just needs a little more time with voltage on it to wake it up fully. All right, power supply is uh, totally cleaned up and looking very nice. I've got it reinstalled and I think I'm ready to give it a test. Uh, I left everything connected like it's supposed to be down here and I disconnected everything that came up and went to the actual machine up top. There's a, a huge bus bar um, with some yellow cables that I disconnected and then there's a uh, plug below that that I disconnected and I'm like 99% certain that's every single piece of power that's coming up to the top half So we should be able to flip the power on and only test just this power supply part now It's a linear power supply, so it shouldn't need a load uh, And what I'm expecting to happen when I flip the big switch up here is for this fan to spin up And then I'm going to come across here and check the different voltages. I have my voltmeter on this one Which I believe is the ground plane uh, so whew, all right, we we're, uh, we're procrastinating long enough. Let's just go ahead and uh, flip the switch. Yeah, that one spun. 
Nothing up top seems like it's come alive. That's good news. Uh, let's check some of these and see if they say anything. 5.3 volts. That's excellent news. 29 volts. That one is 10 volts. And that one is 12 volts. But we definitely have a good 5 volt rail and a good 30 volt rail. And the 30 volt rail looks like it takes up about 5 pins. So I'm guessing that's the primary power to the uh, printer mechanism itself. Uh, but that's awesome. That looks like our uh, power supply is totally working. <laughs> yes, that's great news. That's fantastic news. Well, that was an excellent first step, but it was also the easiest step. Still, I'm going to take any victory I can get because that was, <laughs> that was awesome. We threw some electrons at part of this printer and it actually showed some signs of life. That is an amazing victory and bodes really well for the future. Of course, things get much more complex from here. And I am extremely excited that the power supply came up, but I don't actually know that those are the correct voltage rails that we should be seeing. Uh, we had plus five, plus 10, plus 12, and plus 30. All right, I'm gonna interrupt here for a minute. Uh, and originally I go on for about another 60 seconds or so talking about how uh, I didn't see a negative voltage and I thought that was really strange. There should have been a negative voltage being generated by this. And uh, it turns out that we actually just totally have a negative voltage. I just didn't notice the minus sign on my uh, multimeter here. When I was reviewing the footage, I saw that it was there. So just to prove that I'm not going crazy and that the footage is actually telling the truth, we'll go ahead and flip the uh, power switch back on here. Everything's starting to spin up again. That's good news. And then we'll just go ahead and put this right there. And there we go, minus 12.41 volts. So there's our negative voltage. I was, <laughs> I don't know how I didn't see that the first go around, but we clearly have a negative voltage, which is excellent news. So back to the original footage. So we could be totally in the clear here. And uh, well, since I don't have any documentation or schematics to refer to, we're just going to work under the assumption that the power supply is working because it did appear to be that way. Now things get a lot more difficult though, because we're getting up into this portion here. And the electronic side of it, I'm pretty confident. 7400 series stuff is robust. This looks to be pretty well designed. It's the mechanical side that terrifies me. There are 66 hammers in here and those hammers need to rotate to hit all 132 columns. And uh, there's a giant chain that is spinning at high speed over here. There's all sorts of mechanical stuff that can go very, very wrong from here. And if I take the wrong thing apart, I can totally lose adjustment. And without the proper adjustment procedures in the manual, we could probably never get it back to adjustment. So I need to be very careful about what I take apart and uh, how far down I take this, but I do wanna take it far enough down to make sure that I can get everything cleaned and oiled and greased perfectly so that by the, when we turn the power switch on with power going to everything else, it actually spins up and doesn't bind and break anything. But that's all a problem for future David. Present David is going to go prop his feet up and bask in the glory of a functioning power supply. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching today, and I hope to see you in the next one.